Hello and welcome to Dinish Guarda, Cities ABC Open Business Council series. We are a fast-growing YouTube podcast thought leadership channel focused on profiling the global leading inspiring personalities. Uh, we focus on highlighting and as well mapping the profiles of uh, global leading researchers, CEOs, authors, technologists, academic researchers and the global experts and as well scientists changing and creating solutions to our world. We highlight ideas, products, inventions, software, books and solutions and as well a lot of uh, I've been more increasing excited about the challenge that we have as our next iteration of humans especially when it comes to genetics and as well healthcare and wellness related especially with advances of technology and innovation and as well how can we tackle the challenges and opportunities we face in our cities and nations with the advent of uh, for both the concepts of fourth industrial revolution but as well society 5.0 the idea of a human centric society that manages these technologies properly and of course all the areas of digital transformation and as well uh, artificial intelligence biogenetics blockchain fintech and iot and a lot of other frontier technologies this podcast series are produced and distributed by our platform citiesabc.com and openbusinesscouncil.org and syndicated on intelligenthq.com, fashionabc.org, edgefink and traders dna. Today I have with me someone that I uh, deeply respect and actually I'm deeply honored to uh, interview and profile, Dr. Claire Francomano, that's been involved in care of individuals with the Adler's, um, Adler's Danus syndromes throughout her career and as well special disease for the ones that are listening to us, not so uh, technical. And during her years, she's been um, in multiple positions, like in the National Institute of Health in the US, where she spearheaded a longitudinal study on the natural history of EDS that ran for over 20 years. She has served on the steering committee of the International Consortium of the ehlers danlos Syndrome and Related Conditions, and as chair of the committee on classical ehlers danlos Syndrome of the, for the consortium since 2016. Dr. Claire Francomano um, has been working with the Indiana University um, and joined since August 2019 as a professor of medical and molecular genetics at the IU School of Medicine and director of residency training program in genetics Prior to this university, she as well was the director of the L. Danilo's National Foundation Center for Clinical Care and Research at the Harvey Institute for Human Genetics, Great Baltimore Medical Center, which she joined in 2005 as director of adult genetics. And as well, looking at centered on hereditary disorders of connective tissue and skeletal dysplasis. And she became in 1994 the chief scientist or the chief of medical genetics branch of the National U.S. Human Genome Research Institute and then the National Institute of Health, where she served as clinical director from 1996 to 2001. Uh, I could go for a lot of other things in terms of achievement, both scientific and medical, but uh, what I admire as well is that uh, she has, is one of the leading authorities in genetics, but as well in rare diseases, and has published over 130 peer-reviewed articles and lectures widely around the world uh, about, of course, the ehlers danlos syndromes and related disorders. And as well, she's a keen interest in management of the multiple comorbidities seen in this condition. And as well, she started the, and attended the Yale College as an undergraduate and received an MD in John Hopkins University School of Medicine, where she trained as in internal medicine and medical genetics. So, Welcome to our series. I think a lot of these things not, are not common to all, all the people listening to us. Um, you have much more. You are as well an activist in the sense of looking at these rare diseases and as well an ambassador through us creating awareness, both in the United States and worldwide, but as well um, a very inspiring personality that is trying to make a bridge between the scientific medical uh, world and the rest of the other areas. So welcome to our series. It's uh, wonderful to have you here and I'm very honored and actually very curious about your profile. Thank you so much, Dennis. It's a great pleasure to be here with you. A bit of your background, but as well, 
how did you become the scientist you are right now and the, the doctor? Because I think it's important for, especially for young lady, I have a daughter, so I would love her to learn with people like you and as well inspiring this, um, this trajectory that is astonishing. But as well, how do you went there? Because everyone starts somewhere. I was introduced to genetics at a very young age. I had the opportunity to participate in a training program at the Jackson Laboratory in Bar Harbor, Maine the summer after my junior year in high school. So um, I guess I would have been 17 at the time. And uh, the Jackson Laboratory is a mouse genetics laboratory. Um, They have a wonderful training program for high school and college students. And I spent uh, 10 weeks in Bar Harbor, Maine, learning about genetics and mouse genetics and I was working with a wonderful mentor by the name of Hans-Jörg Heinegger, and he introduced me to a a mouse that had a mutation called hairless. And these mice had an increased risk of cancer, and they had a problem with their immune system. So I was just hooked on genetics at that age, and really beyond that point, I never thought about doing anything else. The Jackson Laboratory had a, a... a course that it ran for two weeks every summer, which was a a partnership between the Jackson Laboratory and Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. And Dr. Victor McCusick was the leader of that course, along with a man named Dr. Thomas Roderick from the Jackson Laboratory. And um, I met Dr. McCusick for the first time that summer when I was 17. And um, that meeting and that exposure led me eventually to attend Johns Hopkins and Dr. McCusick became my mentor. And um, really, as they say, the rest is history. Uh, He was uh, the, the originator of the term heritable disorders of connective tissue and wrote the first book on heritable disorders of connective tissue. So I often say I was kind of inoculated with hereditary disorders of connective tissue at an extremely young age, and um, it really became my life's work. One question related to your childhood. So you started you start at 17, but uh, your parents pushed you to uh, science or was pure... I'm just curious because I think this is important, especially for all the people listening to us around the world, because I think there's a lot of people in universities. And I think that that trajectory of yours that is um, uh, stellar, but important as well to see how that, that started, especially in the early age. My father was a family physician. Um, he was a general practitioner before family practice became a thing. Uh, and then eventually he, uh, he became a formal family practitioner. Um, but he, he had an office in, uh, in the basement of our home. We had you know, built a, an office beneath this ranch home in Yonkers, New York. And um, he, he loved his work. He really loved his work. And I could see he, his patients really loved him. And uh, so he was an inspiration to me, uh, and I decided really at an even younger age that I would be a doctor. I think I probably remember thinking about that when I was about 11. Um, But I was also very interested in music. I took piano lessons, and I took cello lessons, and um, did played a lot of chamber music with my friends. And uh, that summer that I went to the Jackson Laboratory, I was actually planning on going to music camp. I wanted to go to music camp and and play music that summer. And my mother became aware about this program at the Jackson Laboratory. And the way she would introduce things to me, she used to leave material lying around the house for me to pick up and read. So... I, uh, you know, I found this flyer about the Jackson Laboratory, and I, I told her I was interested. It looked interesting, but, you know, I wanted to go to music camp. So she said, well, you know, why don't you apply? You, you probably won't even get in. It's very competitive. You know, you can go to music camp if you want. If they accept you, you can you, you just check it out, you know. So 
I did mostly to appease her. And then, you know, it really changed my life. So then in terms of uh, when you start your career, and I'd like uh, to start on this. So when you start researching from that experience initially, um, you went deep both in genetics and then rare diseases. So can you tell us a bit about that research from the university to um, then becoming uh, an expert in these areas? As a medical student, I had the opportunity to work with Dr. McCusick um, during several rotations that were uh, like elective research rotations. And uh, he introduced me to uh, several different areas. He introduced me to Marfan syndrome, which is um, a hereditary disorder of connective tissue where uh, that's associated with um, aortic root dilatation. So the aorta is the largest uh, artery in the, in the body that comes out of the heart. And at the place where it joins up with the heart, it's particularly vulnerable to stretching. And uh, you can see what we call aortic aneurysms and dissection, uh, which uh, can be a lethal event in these folks. And people with Marfan syndrome are unusually tall, usually, and uh, they have long arms and legs, and they have um, dislocations of the ocular lenses. Those are kind of the hallmark features. So at the time, um, the genetics underlying uh, Marfan syndrome were known. We didn't know anything about the gene uh, that causes Marfan syndrome at that time. And these were the days before the Human Genome Project. So um, when we were looking at genes, we were looking at very, very specific genes. We had very limited technology to explore the genes. We were doing a lot of family studies. Um, during the time that I was in my training, um, people started looking at something called linkage analysis. There were markers up and down the DNA that we could use to try to assign um, a particular disorder to a particular chromosome in the human DNA. It's very, very primitive compared to today's technology. Um, so I started working uh, with Dr. McCusick, finding families that had Marfan syndrome and uh, tracking down the multiple members of those families and uh, collecting DNA from them in order to do these things we called linkage studies. So that was one very early area. And um, Eventually, uh, Dr. Hal Dietz joined my laboratory. This is when I was now a junior faculty member. And um, he was able to, using, using the families that we'd collected over the years do, to do the linkage studies and recognize that um, the Marfan syndrome was linked to a gene called fibrillin and eventually to find that mutations in the fibrillin gene cause the Marfan syndrome. So that happened all in about uh, what was published in 1991. Um, another area that Dr. McCusick introduced to me was the field of genetics in the Amish population. And this was a really, really fascinating and, and very uh, very, very interesting uh, area. Um, the Amish are a, a, a community. Um, they're in the Anabaptist uh, umbrella of religions, and they live um, in a very insular uh, life and keeping uh, very much to themselves. And there's a large Amish community in uh, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, which is only about an hour and a half drive, maybe two hours at the most, from um, Baltimore. And Dr. McCusick had recognized that because um, there's a very, very uh, high degree of inbreeding within the Amish community, the, uh, the Pennsylvania Amish derived from about seven families that migrated there from the Alsace-Lorraine uh, region um, 
and and so almost everybody there is related to everybody else by similar to being second cousins once removed about like that so they're very closely inbred and um, because of that there are a lot of recessive disorders there so those are conditions that require a person to inherit one copy of a variant from each parent and um, so Dr. McCusick had recognized a number of unique uh, genetic disorders among the Amish, and then that there was a high prevalence of some other recessive disorders that had been previously described. And I had the opportunity as a medical student to um, go up to the Amish community and learn about uh, a disease called cartilage hair hypoplasia, it was interesting because this kind of harkened back to my days at the Jackson Laboratory with the hairless mice. Um, these patients had uh, very thin, sparse hair and their immune system was compromised and they had an increased risk of malignancy and they were also extremely short. So this is a condition that's one of the conditions of dwarfism or short stature. And um, so there again, I was col collecting information, trying to categorize and describe the uh, what we call the phenotype or the clinical presentation of cartilage hair hypoplasia, and then um, collecting DNA in the hopes that we would identify the gene. So, and that eventually did happen. Um, there, there's also a large uh, collection of people with cartilage hair hypoplasia in Finland. And uh, a group of Finnish researchers actually were the ones who found the gene for cartilage hair hypoplasia. And we had the opportunity then to collaborate with them and um, find that it's the same gene in the Amish population as well. So that was a very, very interesting and wonderful opportunity for me as, as a medical student and a trainee in genetics. So from the research and for the people that are not so familiar with, with the, the scientific part, could you tell us a bit uh, about some of your achievements that you did so far, uh, especially when it comes to rare diseases and uh, the area of your expertise and as well in genetics at large? I, I was at Johns Hopkins uh, as a faculty member, a full-time faculty member until uh, when did I, 1994. And uh, at that time I left, uh, Dr. Francis Collins was just starting up, at that time it was called the National Center for Human Genome Research. And he invited me to join uh, the National Center for Human Genome Research as an intramural uh, faculty member, an intramural scientist at the NCHGR, is what we called it at that time. Um, and this just seemed like a really fabulous opportunity uh, to work in the intramural NIH system. So uh, with great reluctance, really, I left Johns Hopkins and went down to uh, the National Institutes of Health. And um, I had a couple of roles there. I, I was responsible for the residency training program, which was a combined program between um, the NIH and uh, Children's National Medical Center and Georgetown uh, at, um, in Washington, D.C. And if, while I was there, we expanded that reach and made it a combined program uh, with Johns Hopkins, actually. And that is uh, an ongoing training program now uh, in medical genetics that's running uh, even to today. Um, we had a training program in genetic counseling at the NCHGR, which eventually became the National Human Genome Research Institute. So that's the institute that we recognize today. And um, I became the clinical director of the NHGRI, and I had the opportunity to run my own laboratory there. So we continued um, in the spirit of the work that I had been doing at Johns Hopkins, uh, trying to identify uh, rare diseases that we didn't yet know the, uh, the cause of the disease 
and uh, collect large families and do some uh, linkage analysis to try to find the genes that were involved. And then also to be understanding the underlying uh, molecular um, features, looking at the physiology in the laboratory and the cells. Um, I did a lot of work with achondroplasia, which is the most common form of dwarfism. Uh, we were looking for the cause of that and it turned out to be uh, fibroblast growth factor receptor uh, three, the gene, that gene. And um, again, my laboratory was not the first one to find that gene, but we did a lot of work subsequently looking at multiple members of the, of the achondroplasia family. And um, there's a related disorder. We, we were the first to publish that um, the same gene was involved with hypochondroplasia, which is a similar disorder and then uh, found another extremely rare disease that was eventually called um, severe achondroplasia with developmental delay and acanthosis nigricans, and that that was also caused by mutations in fibroblast growth factor receptor three. So um, that was fascinating, interesting, just a huge, uh, very, very exciting time in genetics. And it was really during those years that the Human Genome Project uh, started up. And uh, here again, Dr. McCusick played an extremely pivotal role. Uh, he and uh, Dr. Francis Collins uh, were really leaders of that project. So to be in the midst of genetics during that time, it was really very, very exciting and, and uh, wonderful, really. So um, I, was, I was at the National Human Genome Research Institute until 2001. And I had been commuting from Baltimore down to uh, Bethesda. I got married in 1987. We had two children and um, commuting back and forth between Bethesda and Baltimore was just, it became really uh, very difficult. I wasn't spending enough time with my family and my children. And I was feeling like I was always on the road. The, it's only 40 miles between Bethesda and Baltimore, but sometimes it can take two hours depending on the traffic, you know, and, I was leaving the house at 5.30 in the morning and getting back home at like 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. And I just was never seeing my kids. My husband was like a single parent. And um, so I decided that I needed to do something different. Um, it was over the Christmas holidays uh, of the year 2000. And the kids uh, were seven and nine. I'd been doing the commute for about seven years. And uh, I just thought, if I do this another seven years, you know, there'll be teenagers, they'll be out of the house, and I'll never know who they are. I'll never, uh, we'll never be a family. So um, I, started, I, I started looking for another position. And I was very fortunate to land at the National Institute on Aging, which is another institute um, within the National Institutes of Health, but they have their home base in Baltimore. So um, there was a position open there and they had a lab open and I was able to transition over to the NIA and to continue uh, my research program and to be able to spend a little less time on the road and a little more time with my family. And that was really what prompted that move. So by that time, uh, the Human Genome Project was in full swing and we had uh, the sequence of the human genome and we were starting to be able to do sequencing on a regular basis. And uh, so we could start incorporating that technology into the laboratory work. And um, people were developing uh, databases of sequence related to specific organs. Like there was a cancer genome anatomy project that was run out of the National Cancer Institute. 
and I started a skeletal genome anatomy project in connection with, in collaboration with my colleagues at the National Institute on Aging. So trying to get all the information that we had available about the genes involved in skeletal development uh, in all in one place. And now, of course, this seems really archaic because we have all the information on the human genome. It's all available uh, anywhere. But at that time, we, we really compartmentalized it and we had very specific databases for specific organ systems and so on. So um, that was really also a great time. And uh, we, we were also doing some work that was interesting then, Dennis, on... Um, a device uh, that measured the human energy field. I had kind of gotten interested, really interested in uh, um, a device that was invented by a, a Russian biophysicist um, named Dr. Konstantin Karatkov. And uh, I was introduced to him by a physician uh, and friend and colleague in Bethesda. And um, he, he uses this device in, in, to measure the human energy field and to pinpoint um, areas that either are, are in danger or re reflecting some pathology within the human body. So the NIA at that time gave me the uh, free reign to look into this device that measures the human energy field. And we started uh, some research related to that. And also uh, had a big symposium that resulted in the publication of a book um, about the human energy field and human bioenergy uh, and bioenergetic medicine. So I really appreciated the open-mindedness of uh, our scientific director at that time, because this was a little out there in terms of um, it, it wasn't related to genetics in any way, uh, except that, of course, our genetics must influence our energy. Uh, but we really had a lot of fun uh, looking into that, too. And then in 2000, uh, 2005, I was approached by the uh, Greater Baltimore Medical Center, which was developing an institute for human genetics. And uh, they had a very forward-thinking board member who wanted to bring the fruits of the Human Genome Project to the practice of medicine in a very practical way. And Dr. Maimon Cohen, who was directing uh, the, the um, Harvey Institute for Human Genetics at Greater Baltimore Medical Center uh, offered me the position of director of adult genetics there. And um, I, I thought, well, you know, this is going to be the next chapter, uh, is bringing all of this information to the actual practice of medicine. Um, and I saw this as an opportunity to really um, bring to the community uh, the fruits of all this work that had been done on the Human Genome Project over the years. And while I was at the uh, National Institute on Aging, I had started this longitudinal project that you mentioned in my introduction. And um, I had gotten really involved with the Ehlers-Danlos. Uh, it was called the Ehlers-Danlos National Foundation back then, and it's now the Ehlers-Danlos Society. So I, I was on their board and I was very involved with um, uh, the care of people with the Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and also looking at the multiple comorbid conditions that are involved with the Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome that, that people suffer with, uh, with the Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And um, really it evolved that Dr. Hal Dietz, who uh, was so involved with the uh, finding of the gene for Marfan syndrome. Uh, he is doing a fantastic job taking care of patients with Marfan syndrome at Johns Hopkins. There's a skeletal dysplasia center at Johns Hopkins. Um, 
and the, those, so those people were well taken care of, but there really wasn't anybody taking care of people with the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes. And this became my mission in life. Um, so really since, I would say since the early 2000s, I've been involved with um, patient care research and advocacy for people with the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes. And that's most of what I do today. You have, um, according to, uh, well, I'm not a scientist, but it's, it's an impressive number of papers. I think you, I saw in terms of data, you have around uh, close to 20,000 citations, <clears throat> at least public in your papers and research. So um, I would like to probably more like a, a practical question. So how do you bridge this research, really high profile research with that work of advocacy and then the work with the physician and with the patients, which is three things very different and uh, very complex as well, especially the kind of research you're doing. I would like to hear that part, especially as a small researcher or I want to be, <laughs> I would like to see how you manage these three things. <laughs> Well, uh, since, since 2005, when I left the NIA to join the Greater Baltimore Medical Center and the Harvey Institute, I haven't run a, a research laboratory. I've been, my research has been predominantly um, clinical and in partnership with other people who are running uh, laboratories uh, on, the, on their own. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with the, the, the uh, Ehlers-Danlos Society, which is now an international organization run by a powerhouse of a woman by the name of Laura Bloom. And um, they have really, under her leadership, the Ehlers-Danlos Society has driven a lot of work uh, that has brought the international community together So in 2016, the International Consortium on the Ehlers-Danlos Syndromes was uh, assembled. And um, we put together four committees, and I think it was a total of 15 or 16 working groups of experts from around the globe to um, come together and review the state of our knowledge about the types of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and the uh, comorbid conditions that we see with the Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. So people with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome have gastrointestinal uh, issues, they have problems in the neuro neurologic uh, area, they have problems with their immune system, Um, they have problems uh, really in multiple, multiple areas, chronic pain, chronic fatigue, and um, the autonomic nervous system seems to be affected. So we had working groups to address each of these areas, as well as um, the uh, There's, there's one working group specifically directed for uh, physical therapy or the allied health professions who, can, who ha are working really actively to develop uh, scientifically based interventions to help people with the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes. So working together with all these folks has enabled me to um, to really understand the science that's behind uh, our understanding of the Ehlers-Danlos Syndromes and uh, what we know and what we need to know, and that has driven further research. I've had the opportunity to work with colleagues at Penn State University, my uh, very good friend and colleague, Dr. Rebecca Bascom uh, and Dr. Jane Schubart, and we have been especially during these COVID times, we've been meeting on Zoom uh, very regularly and writing papers and, um, and putting grant applications together. And this has helped move the science forward uh, tremendously. I'm really, I mean, I, I, I'm a firm believer that none of us does anything in a vacuum. And uh, 
the teams are just really, really important. And when I think about sort of the arc of my career and uh, the people who've been so important to, my, to me in my development, I, um, you know, I for sure wouldn't be where I am without the mentors that I had along the way and uh, the people that I've had the opportunity to work with. It's all, it's, it's been a group team effort from start to finish. I love that. And I think that is very important, especially understanding the importance of collaboration. And I love the mentorship as, a, as well, been teaching in business schools. I think we all learn with each other and that we cannot do things on our own. So, so Dr. Claire, one of the things that I'm particularly curious, so I'm a, a huge, uh, well, reader of history and especially as well, the bridges between history and the evolution of humanity. So, and the, one of the questions I have for you, and now I'll go a bit, a bit more on top level macro science, but I'm particularly interested. So in the last, uh, let's say in the last 30 years, and especially with the leading global authorities like you, we advanced quite significant studies and research to a level that we are right now on the cutting edge of, of starting to come up with new solutions, especially in the areas of biogenetics, and especially bearing in mind your research, because we have to look at that. So one of the questions I have, and probably this is a bit a long question, but I would like to have your opinion. So if you look at uh, the evolution of humanity, uh, let's say we have, let's say in terms of a species, uh, especially if you look at uh, Professor Yuval Noah Harari book of Sapiens, we're talking about the evolution of, let's say of, uh, the millions of years of, of, of evolution of humanity, but especially in the last 40, 40,000 years, we are kind of the species of Homo sapiens. And now we are a bit of an abridged, especially with the research that we have in genetics, with the possibility of starting to firstly look at even some of the rare diseases that we have, starting to look at these and integrating these in computing and digital technologies and accelerate these well, a lot of new bridges towards different possibilities. Um, I know that is not your area, but you are more focused on, on specific parts. But how do you see this bridge that we have right now, especially with the, with the, if you look at history, we, as humans, until the 19th century, we were mostly always the same, <laughs> agriculture, things like that. But after the 19th century, we were the, re the first revol industrial revolution. And since then, we accelerate a lot of the things that um, permits us to, to rethink uh, all our genetics and different things. So I would like to hear your opinion as an academic and as well as a researcher and as well as a, a leading authorities in these areas. That's a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> I know that it's well, <laughs> provocative, but yeah, I would like to hear. I, I have a particular lens that I look at this question through um, because of my experience with the rare diseases. And... Um, I think that uh, we can use we can use the knowledge that genetics offers to improve the lives of people with with rare disorders um, by understanding what the fundamental causes are and um, and developing rational therapies to approach the the underlying pathology. Um, It's been a little bit challenging because, uh, you know, there, there are people in the rare disease communities who believe that um, society should change to accommodate uh, the needs of people with disabilities rather than forcing people with, who are differently abled uh, to adapt to the norm. And, um, you know, the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, the ADA in the United States, was a major effort to, uh, to try to make um, living in, in the world more accessible to people who have uh, differences in height or differences in mobility and those kinds of things. When, um, when I was uh, involved, well, the year the gene for achondroplasia was found, um, 
I think this was 1994, but I'm not 100% certain about that. Uh, I, we've, we identified the gene for achondroplasia, and I went to a support group meeting for the Little People of America, which is the organization that supports persons with, um, with short stature in the U.S. And I went up to the hotel counter to register for this meeting, <clears throat> and I found uh, one of my a friend, I'd, somebody I'd known for many years through the Little People of America organization, and they were wearing a t-shirt that said, Dwarf, Endangered Species. And there was this worry <clears throat> that by knowing the gene for achondroplasia, that we would be able to offer prenatal diagnosis and that people would be terminating pregnancies uh, carrying dwarfs and that they would, that there wouldn't be any people with achondroplasia anymore. And <clears throat> so this was, it was a really fraught discussion at that meeting of the Little People of America. Like, how are we going to use this information and how would it actually help to improve the lives of people living with achondroplasia rather than to endanger them um, as, as a community? And I know this has been an issue for uh, people in the deaf community as well. You know, there's this idea that uh, sign language um, should be available as a, as a, a translation option. And um, there are people in the deaf community who, who really feel like that that is a, it's a community and they should be respected and appreciated as a community with different abilities, but uh, equally valuable abilities. So <clears throat> we have to be really careful about how we think about implementing the uh, genetic knowledge that we have. And particularly uh, these days, you know, the, the CRISPR technology to uh, modify uh, genetic the genes, um, we have the ability now to go in and actually uh, change a single nucleic acid among our three billion uh, our three billion base pairs of DNA. Um, and I think the way we incorporate that technology into moving forward and trying to improve the lives of people living with uh, both rare diseases and also common diseases. What can we do to change the genome of a cancer, for example, to, um, to address all kinds of different uh, medical issues? We just have to think about it very, very carefully because uh, we, we want to preserve the uniqueness of every human being and the value of every human being and respect uh, and acknowledge what each individual uh, brings to our collective table. Um, so it's, this, is, this is what the um, ELSI project of the National Human Genome Research Institute is really all about, the ethical, legal, and social implications of understanding our genome and being able to manipulate it. Um, it's, it's, it's something we need to approach with, really with reverence, I would say, and with very great care. No, that is very, a very, very sensitive. And I think this is a bridge, especially because genetics is so sensitive and as well, what you mentioned, for instance, right now, let's say if you look at history, Napoleon was very small, so it could be kind of a dwarf. If you look at Professor Hawkins, for instance, my father is a disabled person. So some of these disabilities make what we are as humans. I would like to, to touch a bit, it's a bit more philosophy, but of course, as a, as a researcher, you are on the, the science bridge and as well on the human part and as well on disability. So in terms of the, how do you see these topics of ethics around the, especially that right now we are advancing quite significantly into, into biogenetics, but as well touching the things with rare diseases, because this, let's say, like you said, imagine if we, we 
I don't know if, uh, if using artificial intelligence right now, we can eventually find a way of eliminating this. Then we have to make a decision. Do you want to eliminate this or you want to accept um, the same trajectory? So how do you see this ethic, this part of the ethics, which for me is the most important thing of the, probably the biggest question for the, the stage of humanity. And I think we're not reflecting this as much as probably we should. So I would like to have your opinion both personal and scientific, of course. So, you know, the four basic tenets of uh, medical ethics that we think about, uh, let me see if I can remember them. The, uh, we talk about autonomy. The, um, the person who is affected by the condition, the person in front of us, our patient, should be able to make their own decisions. They should judge for themselves what's best for them. And um, we want to support people in their ability to make those decisions. We want them to be as informed as possible um, and to make those decisions uh, according to their own beliefs. So that is really what we do in genetic counseling is we provide people with the information uh, about what they can do if they're trying to make reproductive decisions or if they're trying to make decisions about their own um, health, that they have as much information as we can offer uh, to enable them to make the most informed decision possible. And then in terms of beneficence, uh, as, as a profession, we're trying to do the best we can to, uh, to help people you know, we want, we want to improve people's lives to the extent that we can to help their quality of life and to help them uh, perform to the best of their ability and to do the things that they choose to do with their lives. And in terms of non-maleficence, we want to do no harm. That is our primary tenet, right, as, as physicians, is do no harm. First, do no harm. So... In the interest of promoting autonomy and promoting beneficence and non-maleficence or doing no harm, I think if we, if we think about those three uh, tenets as our guiding principles, we will make the right choices um, moving forward. And I think I like the way simplicity you put it because I think it's really important that we we keep the basis very important. And I think the importance of, as well, highlighting science. So um, I have two more questions related with your uh, profile and as well scientific research. So from the research you did so far, and as well as a global uh, recognized um, uh, expert and as well uh, researcher in rare diseases, so what situation or what stage do you think we are right now? Let's say from a, from a macro level perspective, probably for our audience looking at this that is not so scientific. Uh, the Human Genome Project has made really an unbelievable impact in our understanding of human disease, both for rare diseases and for common diseases. We understand so much more uh, now than we did 30 or 40 years ago about the genetics of rare diseases because precisely because of the Human Genome Project and its ability, it has just catapulted us um, into an understanding of uh, the genes that underlie literally thousands and thousands of rare diseases. Um, so, and unfortunately, the Ehlers-Danlos uh, syndromes, there, we have 14 different Ehlers-Danlos syndromes. Uh, there are different types of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And um, the genes that underlie 13 of those are known, but the most common type, which is the hypermobile type, we still don't under, understand. We don't know the genes that underlie the hypermobile type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So that, for me, that's really one of the great challenges of our time. And um, I have the privilege to be working with the uh, Ehlers-Danlos Society and Dr. Woody Gandhi and the Hedge Project, which we're, we're trying to find those genes by uh, collecting um, DNA samples from a thousand 
patients with the hypermobile type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and sequencing their whole genome um, and trying to find the, uh, the genes that underlie that condition. So that's just a little, a little side note that that's a big, big effort underway right now. The issue is once we have the genes, uh, what, what can we do? How can we translate our knowledge of the, um, the underlying genetics into therapies that will help improve people's quality of life. And um, I think that's really where our biggest challenge lies right now is uh, we, we know the genes for thousands and thousands of rare diseases, but how do we take that information and um, translate it into practical therapies? And uh, I, I really see that as, as the biggest challenge of our time right now is moving from the knowledge of the genetics into practical applications that will help improve, improve people's lives. You've been sharing uh, the National Genetics uh, Committee over there in the U.S., and as well, we've been very on the forefront of a lot of the work that has been done in terms of genetics. And of course, you mentioned the Genome Project before. Could you give us a bit of an update where we stand right now when it comes to genetics and research, and as well a bit of the Genome Project? Because I think it's quite interesting for especially broader audience that has not so much scientific knowledge to understand the stage that we are on that level. Yes. So... Um the, the, the Human Genome Project sequenced the, the genomes of two individuals. And um, the sequence for those two individuals, uh, it took, I, I don't know, it was over a billion dollars to do that work. And, um, and it took probably five years to get it done. And uh, when we think about the scope of the genome, the human, the human genome in its entirety contains 3 billion base pairs of DNA. So you're reading the sequence of, of DNA in 3 billion locations on the human genome. And um, the, the ability to sequence that DNA has... Um, it's increased, our, our technology has improved so rapidly since the mid-1990s that we can now do, offer the whole genome sequencing, all the three billion base pairs, to an individual for under $1,000. So I heard somebody say recently, not that long ago, that if the cost of cars had come down as quickly as the cost of sequencing over the years since 1994, we could buy a Toyota Corolla for a quarter, <laughs> 25 cents. So it's the, the uh, technology has just exploded in terms of our access to it we can it's it's so much more accessible to the to the general public um, so we are able to sequence dna uh, really at very very minimal cost now and we have um, the ability to there there are two ways that we look at the genome we can look at the exome which is a look at the genes that are known in the human genome. And um, there, right now we have about 22,000 genes that are recognized. And they encode particular proteins. Each gene encodes a protein. Um, and um, we can look at the genes that encode, that are normal coding genes. Uh, we look at the exome. But that's just a small percentage of the whole genome. So uh, the exome, I believe, constitutes something around maybe 5% of the entire genome. And there are a lot of secrets hidden in that genome that I think we still have yet to uncover. Um, so in looking at 
patients with rare diseases, typically if they have an undiagnosed condition uh, that hasn't been recognized before, uh, we will first go to an exome and see if we can find alterations in any of the known genes. And then if we don't see anything there, we can go to a genome. But sometimes that's not, it's just not enough because we don't know enough about the variation within the genome the whole, at large and um, the implications of those uh, variant DNA sequences um, to really be able to understand how those variants impact uh, individuals. So there are a lot of really interesting opportunities that are available now where people are trying to meet up. Um, so if I'm in my office in Indianapolis and I have a patient with a rare constellation of conditions and uh, I've never seen it before and I can't find a, a report in the literature of anybody else who's published on a patient like that. And then somebody in Istanbul, a geneticist in Istanbul, is looking at another patient that has the same constellation of findings. We can both put our, our patients into a program that will help us identify other patients similar to ours. And by doing so, then we can recognize new conditions. Um, so this is a way that technology is bringing geneticists together from around the globe to help advance uh, the knowledge of rare diseases and the understanding of the um, genes that underlie these rare conditions. That's uh, impressive, and I think uh, the velocity has been quite astonishing. So one question right now that I have as a person that comes actually from two completely different worlds, so from the world of, of uh, ideas, poetry, and philosophy, which was actually my first study on languages, and then I went to completely to technology. So I always try to bridge, um, of course, my literary, humanistic um, background with my technology, more scientific background that I got, uh, especially the last uh, uh, decades. So one of the, one of the questions I have, uh, bearing in mind that you are dealing with very cutting edge research in terms of uh, rare diseases and, and genetics, um, are you at the moment doing your research purely on the laboratories and using traditional scientific tools or are you using right now digital technological tools to accelerate some of these? I know that in the Genome Project right now, there's a lot of studies going on and there's well a lot of companies like Google with Kalekika and a lot of other digital artists. A bit of, are you using these tools? I know that you are as well doing a lot of uh, education, but I would like to hear especially on this, uh, this area. My, my research right now is predominantly clinical. Um, I am involved with the HEDGE study, which will be sequencing, doing the sequencing uh, on uh, the thousand uh, genomes that I mentioned earlier uh, to try to find the underlying uh, cause of the hypermobile type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. I'm also involved with um, uh, an ethicist at IU. Uh, his name is Colin Halverson. And he's been conducting uh, interviews with patients with the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes and doing what we call qualitative research, which looks at um, the themes involved in the discussion and um, does a lot of word searching and uh, uh, sort of, I think we could say, uses some artificial intelligence to try to ferret out uh, meaning behind uh, the interviews that are in there. And I honestly believe that the whole artificial intelligence um, arena is going to help us tremendously with the um, understanding of that enormity of the human genome that we really don't understand fully well yet. So as I was mentioning before, with we, if we find variants when we do a whole genome sequence, often we really don't understand the implications of those variants because they haven't been seen before. So if we can use AI to um, pull together 
all the variants with uh, a lot of phenotypic information that can help us in interpreting um, the genetic information that we have before us. Uh, I'm looking forward as well to see these possibilities and especially to do it with the angle of ethics. So um, in conscious of time, and I thank you for so much for your time. So uh, I will probably ask my last two questions. So the, 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 the next one is about education and uh, the work you've been doing, you mentioned uh, both in terms of uh, advocate and education. I know that you're working a lot on that. So could you tell us a bit about that work? Because I think uh, education is one of my key passions as well being a teacher for a long time. Although I don't have a lot of time now, but I do it online. So if you could give me a bit of a, a bit of an overview about what you're doing on that, and there's also my light. Yes, I'm, I'm passionate about, uh, about the education side, be, uh, partly because I, really I recognize that the, um, the role that these educational programs played in my own uh, development. Um, I, I had the privilege to direct the residency program at the NHGRI for several years, and now uh, at Indiana University, um, I'm director of the residency program in genetics here. And we just started a combined residency program in pediatrics and genetics. So uh, people can come out of medical school and enter directly into this program. And I'm really, really excited about this. Um, we uh, will be interviewing the first candidates for this new program actually just today. So I'm very excited about that. But I, I have another uh, educational initiative that I'm involved with, which I think is really, really exciting. And this is called the ECHO program. Um, and uh, the Ellers Danlos Society has spearheaded this uh, ECHO program for EDS under the leadership of Dr. Alan Hakim. The ECHO uh, idea was developed by Professor uh, um, Aurora at the University of New Mexico. And uh, Professor Aurora is a hepatologist. He was one of the first to treat hepatitis C in the United States. And he had a very, very long waiting list of people who needed help with hepatitis C. So he came up with this idea of telementoring for other professionals who are taking care of people with liver disease. And he developed a hub and spoke model where he was the hub and then other academic centers were the spokes and people would call in on Zoom and they would have an hour long discussion of a didactic uh, topic and then also talk about cases and share best practices about taking care of cases. So uh, this was enormously successful and he was able to transmit information to other professionals about how to care for patients with hepatitis C very, very effectively in that way. And since that time, Project ECHO has, um, has led to uh, programs in over 250 different diagnostic categories, wide range, rare childhood cancers and fibromyalgia and everything in between. So um, we developed a Project ECHO for Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and under the leadership of Dr. Hakeem and uh, Laura Bloom and the Ehlers-Danlos Society. And it started with uh, two programs for professionals, one out of the UK and one out of Baltimore and now uh, in Indianapolis under uh, my leadership. And um, we've subsequently, there have been ECHO programs that have been developed for advocacy. So for people with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome who are interested in learning about uh, advocacy and promoting advocacy for EDS. Uh, for pediatrics, for orthopedics, for the rare type of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome called vascular Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. So we are getting the word out about Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome to professionals who are caring for patients with these diseases around the world. And um, I really, really think this is uh, a way forward to help with uh, providing care for patients with rare diseases and to increase the population of uh, physicians and providers who are knowledgeable and um, 
able to provide that care. For me, it's a key work, this works in scientific collaboration and education. And I think all these programs that you have. So probably my last question and conscious of your time as well and respect for young people, let's be young lady that is right now starting a research right now or a young research in whatever the world, we have people from five continents. What would be the advice you give them? Because of course we are in a different world right now. And I know that you are a wonderful, not just a, a wonderful exceptional scientist, but as well a, a, a human focus personality. So there's a lot of more questions, but I would like to have the, this advice and probably we'll have a second question about a second interview, probably in the near future about genetics. I would like to ask more. When, when young people find something that really sparks their passion, um, they should just pursue it to the, to the ends of the earth and, uh, and to find a mentor or two or three, uh, who can help them along that journey. Um, to ask questions, to take opportunities, to volunteer if they have that option uh, in uh, areas where they are interested in working and learn as much as they can just to be a sponge and soak it up and, um, and reach out for help uh, to people who have gone that way before them. Um, I think that you can't overstate the importance of mentorship uh, and making those connections. And so if you don't know the person who you want to reach out to, you know, we, we have this idea of six degrees of separation. There's somebody in your circle who will know somebody who knows somebody and uh, just keep working those connections to try to get to the person who has the information that you need. Oh, wonderful. And I think that's a very good way to, to final up. And I think uh, we'll put all the links to your multiple different uh, platforms and research to your Google Scholar. I'm sure that everyone listening to us that wants to get deep will, will understand. Thank you so much, Claire, for the inspirational. I learned a bit more about these areas, a lot more, actually. <laughs> and I will be continuing humbling working on this. Thank you for your time as well. It's been an honor. Thank you so much, Dennis. It's been a pleasure.